Zodiac killer theories are so varying and prolific in the true crime space and generally just within our nation's psyche and truthfully, like even internationally. So much so that at this point, I'd argue the saying, opinions are like assholes. Everyone's (laughs) got one. Like it kind of applies. Yeah. You know, seems apt. Hey, Cassie. Hey, Caitlin. Hi, creepy people. Hello. Hello. This is PNW Haunts and Homicides. Just a little reminder, the $1 tier of Patreon is open now for a limited time. Limited time means it will end. It will end. So get in there while you can. (laughs) (laughs) We will close it back up again. Uh, You will still be able to keep the $1 Patreon here oh, okay. once that's... we close it. So just in case there was any confusion last week from that. Yeah, um... that's good to know. That's a good thing to point out. <laughs> yeah. You're like grandfathered in, basically. Exactly. Exactly. And then you will get your little complimentary tarot reading in your welcome card. So I don't know. Like, why wouldn't you do it? I'm not really sure. I'm struggling to come up with a reason. Also, make sure to give us your address. <laughs> Oh, yeah. So we can personally deliver. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> We're just sending him through the mail. But. Yeah. To be clear, you will not receive the tarot card in <laughs> any form if you don't provide your address. Yeah. That's kind of need that. That's important. Yeah. It's critical, <laughs> as it turns out. <laughs> as indie podcasters, we love to show our support of other awesome shows. So stay tuned for the promo we've got to share with you this week. Let's show them some love. You can find their info in our show notes. Sup, everyone. Brian here, host of the TV and Movie Trivia Podcast. It's a trivia-style podcast focusing on TV and movies. Listen in for questions like, what's the name of Michael Scott's screenplay? What do you say to view the Marauder's map? What are Tony Stark's last words to Thanos in Avengers Endgame? And where does Ron Burgundy say he is when he calls the news station sobbing from a phone booth? I've covered The Office, Harry Potter, Marvel, Will Ferrell movies, Lord of the Rings, and more, with even more on the way. So play along to the TV and movie trivia podcast anywhere you get podcasts, and stay tuned for more trivia! You guys, we're back! And don't worry, we did get more wine. Well, of course. All right. Well, should we get on with the show? If we must. Yeah, we really have to. We're on a schedule. All right. Okay. Are we? Yeah. No, I mean, mm. (laughs) we're in trouble. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. I would say so. Charles Murray Myers was born June 14th of 1933 to Lillian Myers. Gemini. This kid had a rough start in life, and least of all because he was a Gemini. Aw. Yeah. Those Geminis. I know. They get a bad rap. And he's kind of case in point why. Uh oh. Just, uh, just so you know. <laughs> if you're a Gemini listening, we know you're not like him. I mean, you could. I don't know you. Get out of here. I don't know your life. <laughs> <laughs> he was told his biological mother was actually his aunt. So again, already not off to a great start because that's a real Bundy vibe this dude has going on. Mommy issues. Yeah. Distinctly unattractive, I would say. Yeah. Reportedly, he did not know that Lillian was his real mother until he was 16. Then you get all the crazy teenage hormones, so. Oh, that's a bad time to find out, like, your whole life has been a lie. It's literally a bad mm. time to find out anything. Just, like, walk around with, like, blinders on. Just <laughs> just try to exist. He never knew his father, but he would be told that the man was charged for his conception or birth. I'm unclear on the exact phrasing, except that it implied 
His father had been fined for having a child out of wedlock, using some variation of the dreaded B word to describe the faultless infant. Oh, yeah. Wow. Sorry. <laughs> I don't know why I started talking like there was actually a four-year-old in the room. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe just because I'm talking about his early life, it feels weird. Yeah. <laughs> If there is a four-year-old within earshot in your room, I highly recommend, I don't know, maybe having them leave said room or you leave the room or having them engage in heavy-duty earmuffs. Yeah. <laughs> you know, air quotes, earmuffs, because it's certainly not going to last. You guys know me better than that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, for sure. The boy's mother was allegedly charged with grand larceny and would be sentenced to serve one to seven years in prison. So this is after he's born. Um, he's a baby, Aww. just a little gay. And that's, it's just, just a real snowball situation here. Though it wouldn't be until 1935, when he was about a year old, that she died by suicide. Oh. reportedly right before his eyes. Oh. Later, this would be given by way of explanation for his descent into evil and his, frankly, horrific crimes. That is very traumatic. Like, that will yeah. change a person for sure. Right? I know. I'm like, wait, did they base Dexter on this? Did that happen in Dexter? Have you never watched Dexter? I gotta watch it again. Well, you probably are like when they show what happens probably. to his. Yeah, it's really awful. Um, okay. His mother had battled with severe depression for some time. She reportedly shot herself in the stomach. Oh my God, no. Her eventual cause of death was said to be septicemia. Oh. Which is a life threatening complication of an infection. Yeah. So, you know, just a horrific way to end one life while starting and immediately fucking up another. <sighs> Following her death, he was adopted by his aunt and uncle. Mary Ethel and Fred Edwards, of course, renamed him. They what? Yeah. If I'm being honest... That's really where the true crime starts in this story. Everything up to this point is really just mainly tragic. But renaming the boy Edward, middle initial W, and then having him take their married name Edwards. Oh my goodness. That's fucking Joker level diabolical. So you guys, in case that was at all confusing, Charles is now Edward W. Edward. Ew. 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 Newly named Edward W. Edwards. Ew. <laughs> would spend his childhood being shuffled around numerous foster homes or orphanages where, as we hear in many of these so-called origin stories, he was both physically and sexually abused. Oh, that's just so unfortunate. It really is. They're already having a hard time. Yeah. He was in trouble regularly as a teen, landing him in juvenile detention prior to a brief stint in the Marines. He was dishonorably discharged, and from there, he would live as a thief and a drifter. But that's far too brief an overview of his track record of, as the kids, I believe, say, wilding out. <laughs> so let's go to the tape for this horrific highlight reel from the top. As Cassie pointed out, uh, he was adopted, and then I said something about orphanages, Say what? Yeah, what? Yeah. I was very confused. <laughs> yeah. Um. Basically, uh, I'm tr I'm trying to find a way to summarize this, and nobody could handle this kid. Aww. He just was 
kind of hell on wheels. And he would get taken in someplace and it just would never last long. He just, he just had a way of literally burning every bridge. And it, I mean, it shouldn't be that surprising given what's happened to him up to this point in his life. Yeah, no. Yeah. Yeah. We've talked about it. Like that shit will change you. That shit will change you. When another child at the orphanage he was living in at the time had a birthday party, complete with chocolate cake, of course. Ew. Ew. (laughs) Edward was refused a piece by the other child. That is so fucking mean. I know. So literally being bullied. I mean, this is something that happens in some of these like juvenile, whether it's like a detention facility or, you know, children that are placed there for their protection or because they don't have family, whatever the circumstance, there can be this element of like cruelty even from the other children. Yeah. That makes sense because like where else are they going to put all their energy? That's, I know. I mean, it's a lot of kids trying to process a lot of hurt. And that's not to say that, like, it's okay. And obviously, we wish that wasn't the case. But it's okay. Edward gets his revenge. Oh, shit. (laughs) He later stole the cake from the birthday boy's locker. (laughs) Um, Unfortunately, Edwards received a beating from one of the nuns after which he ran away oh, at the tender age of just seven. Seven. For stealing some cake. I mean, it's a real dick move, but I don't think you're supposed to beat people over I it. I mean, is it a dick move if, like, they were a dick to you first? I know. Like, here's the thing. I would have let you keep the other half of this case if you just... This cake. I would have let case you of keep... of wine. <laughs> 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 I would have let you keep the other half of this cake if you'd just given me a single piece. But you turned down that smoking deal. Gosh. Yeah. I just, so I thought you were going to say they made him like eat the entire thing like in Matilda. (laughs) (laughs) Which is not that kind of an orphan movie. Abusive. Yeah. I I would argue. Yeah. Yeah. He received another beating when he was recovered by a clergy member. So when you get found and brought back, you're, you know, brought back home. Your reward is um, we beat the shit out of you again. So (sighs) even so, it wouldn't be long before he escaped again. It kind of actually became his thing. That makes sense. I know, right? (laughs) I'm like, listen. Challenge accepted. I'm going to keep escaping until I get it right and y'all don't find me. Right. (laughs) This time, he hitchhiked all the way to his hometown of Akron, Ohio. Sadly, in this instance, even though he made it all the way to his hometown, his grandmother swiftly returned him to the orphanage. Grandma, no. Of course, this escape cost him a beating as well. After numerous escapes, he was apparently rejected by the orphanage for good, which I did not know could happen. You know? Who knew? They're just like really sick of beating this child. Yeah, they're like, listen, my hand got to take care of that thing. I use it to beat other children. Like maybe this isn't working and you should find another method of helping him or like, you know, maybe know. weird. Like the 40s though, mm-hmm. you know, the the 30s, the 40s, like meh. in 1945, however, he was once again living with his grandmother. And by this point, he had decided to become a career criminal. Oh, okay. It's a choice. (laughs) It's a choice. He would later describe his various schemes and theft, particularly at the height of World War II, rationing in great detail. He stole from his grandmother, often selecting her cigarettes from the readily available loot 
and selling them because hmm. they rationed fucking everything in World War II. Damn. In case you didn't know. <sighs> he would move on to other petty theft later as well because, you know, that's how that works. Escalating. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. His aunt slash adoptive mother Mary passed away that fall. Oh, uh, uh, uh. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I was <laughs> like, like, am I supposed to be sad about Well, I was, like, yeah, okay. I, that's what I was like. I mean, like, uh, that's how I felt yeah. when I was writing it. So I wanted to see how you, like, you okay. reacted. Yeah. Same way. Yeah. yeah. Like, uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> like, question? Did mark? he care? I'm wrong. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Around this time, he took work in a bowling alley as a pin setter. Oh, blast from the past. <laughs> like he had to manually place yeah. all of the pins. Yes, that was a person's job. Damn. Yeah. He also became obsessed with pulling fire alarms. <laughs> That's not what I thought you were going to say. What did you think I was I don't say? know. Okay. Just that was I <laughs> pulling fire alarms. <laughs> yeah. He also enjoyed making prank calls for EMS and taxi drivers and, you know, etc. It didn't take the police long to look his way, but he was very manipulative. So his family members were convinced he couldn't have been responsible for the mischief. The same family members <laughs> who <laughs> couldn't keep him around yeah. were like, oh, no, no, oh, no. no. No, you got the wrong guy. (laughs) He'd place the calls and then quickly move to start a conversation with others in the household to establish his alibi for the period in question. Mm, Which I know. (laughs) It honestly it seems like an overly simplistic plan, but apparently that worked. Wow. Yeah. (laughs) Eventually, he developed a crush on a neighborhood. Divorcé. Oh. Ooh. Like, I'm picturing, what's that show? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking your guess is as good as mine. The, the horny housewives. The desperate housewives. <laughs> I was thinking Cougar Town. <laughs> oh. Yeah, Courtney Cox and uh, Dr. Cox's wife from Scrubs. Wow, Cox. Lots of Cox. All the Cox. All the Cox. <laughs> Love them Cox. Anyway. But you see, it seems like at the time, this woman had a boyfriend. The audacity. She can't have more than one? (laughs) (laughs) Well, he's a child. Oh, oh, I'm okay. Mm -hmm. I didn't put that together. Yeah. So he's still underage. Mm -hmm. Okay. So inappropriate relationship. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) He was determined to get rid of the boyfriend, though. He vandalized the man's truck by dousing it in turpentine before setting it ablaze. Wow. Bold. Bold moves. That is like a lot of fire. That is that is a lot. <laughs> Later, he would recall the thrilling feeling of nearly being caught. Mm. Which, okay. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I'm running out of flags. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. (laughs) Need more of the red ones over here. (laughs) Because, of course, he got away with it, which is literally nightmare fuel. I, uh, uh, like, God help any woman who's just living her life that has, like, a crazed 11-year-old boy or however old he was, like, ah, crushing on her. From next door, you know? Setting her man's car on fire. Yeah. Listen, if it had happened at certain points in my life, that'd be a really good story now. (laughs) Now? (laughs) Now. But you see, apparently, somehow, that wasn't enough to scare this dude off. So she must have been really hot. Mm Mm-hmm. Something. Yeah. (laughs) Just something real good. Uh (laughs) Uh-huh. Yep. (laughs) <laughs> That's why I worded that the way I did. <laughs> At the point that the man returned with a new work truck, 
Edwards decided it was time to take his plan to the next level. Which, what fucking level is there? Be uh, Like, launch the truck into space? Like, is that the next level? <laughs> oh, did he? Uh, <laughs> no. But if you get that joke, I need you to DM, DM or email us. So, it turns out, um, next level was not really that next level. Um, he started lighting matches and dropping them directly into the gas tank one night. Oh, okay. I thought you were just going to say like leaving them by the car. And I was like, the prank's too small, Winston. Like, <laughs> <laughs> But damn, literally throwing a match in the gas tank? Yeah. Which on the one hand, I think it's a marvel that no one was harmed by the explosion that you might be picturing occurring. Right. But nothing ever did come of it. I think older matches from this era dropped into a confined space with less air and already filled to the brim with liquid, even if it was flammable. I think that explains why the plan failed. But who knows? Maybe just dumb luck. I mean, I was going to say, like, if it had, it probably would have killed him or oh, injured I mean, him. Yeah, yeah. No, nothing ever came of it. Ugh, that's almost too bad, I want to say. I, you know? I feel like maybe some stuff could have been avoided if that had happened. Seems that way. Okay. Sure does. So, moral of the story, make gas tanks more flammable. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. Just so we're clear. At age 13, his grandmother was officially named his guardian. She would relinquish custody to a boy's juvenile detention facility a short time later. So, I mean, you know. What was even the point? I, it's hard to say. <laughs> the psychiatric evaluation would reveal that even at this early stage of life, he had a habit of... Oh, doing things that necessitate a trigger warning, um, of forcing his sexual advances on other children. No. Both male and female. Mm -hmm. In this facility, he claimed homosexuality was rampant, with guards frequently propositioning boys living there with cigarettes or, in some cases, forcibly taking what they wanted. Mm -hmm. He would credit his strength and fighting abilities for preventing him from becoming an easy victim, which, uh, okay, whatever so you say, Edward. Then he turns around and victimizes other people? Yeah. Ew. <laughs> God. Gross. He obtained a position with a dairy farm after living in that facility for about a year. But don't worry, this kid has got Big, big plans. He'd make quick work of utilizing that position as an escape opportunity. He hopped on a nearby train that went straight to, wouldn't you know, Akron, Ohio. Stop going back to Ohio. His hometown. Like, why does he want to go there so bad? Nothing good ever happened. I, it, correct. <laughs> Come on, <Arguably>. dude. <laughs> For two weeks... He didn't contact his family, but he did use their names to run up tabs for clothing, candy, really whatever he wanted with various department stores. Okay, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. It appears that he's wising up, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on whether or not you're related to him. Yeah. <laughs> but... He was then offered another work position and living situation outside of the facility he'd been placed in. They're like, eh, why don't we try something else? <laughs> <laughs> this particular reform center demanded back-breaking work, long hours, and offered very little in return. Mm. Yay. Sounds fun. Yeah. But, I mean, because, duh, that's kind of their thing. So he ran away from this facility as well. At age 16, he was placed with his grandmother again. Can, okay. I, I don't, I got nothing. 
This is right around the time he was stumbling into his latest development as a juvenile criminal. Breaking and entering. Oh, the fun stuff. Yeah. He would use stolen credit cards to make purchases before disposing of them. It's around this time that he claimed to become something of a ladies' man. He was then sent to a different detention prison for breaking curfew because, you know, you're going to sneak out and outside of business hours to sweet talk the ladies. (laughs) In his later book, he would brag about his sexual exploits in the segregated female population of the facility. And this is why the phrase Gavomiting was invented because I am, in fact, <laughs> gagging and vomiting at this moment. Gross. Do you think uh-huh. any of it's true? Uh, I, I feel like know. a lot of it maybe wasn't consensual. It Well, and here's the thing. I saw your little thinker light up when I said book. Not just a hat rack. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And I'm going to get to that. Don't you worry. Oh, boy. Uh Uh-huh. When he escaped again, he hitchhiked to Cleveland from there. And I told you. Did I? Did I not? I told you that this would become his thing. You know? Escaping. Escaping. Yeah. Very Bundy-ish. Right? You did call it in the beginning. Oh, I sure did. God, there's more parallels than I even really realized. You know what that makes me say? Hashtag never Bundy. Also, hashtag ew. Ew. (laughs) (laughs) From there, he took and passed the Marine Corps test just before his 17th birthday. Because probably what we should do is hand this man a gun. Oh, totally. He was apprehended a few days later and returned to the detention facility. Just like a few days later? Like... (laughs) What is he doing? Yeah, I mean, really just, like I said, whiling out, <laughs> I think is the term. Though they would soon receive word that he was to be transferred to the Paris Island Marine Training Facility. However, <laughs> you thought he got a lucky break and he was going to go and serve in the military. No. I don't know if I would call I mean, like, boot fuck. camp for Marines. Yeah. I, I mean, it's <laughs> pretty bad way. when that seems like the lucky break. Yeah. <laughs> I think. Right? Damn. Okay. Around this time is when the bill passes requiring members of the various branches of service to reach the age of 18 prior to enlisting. Well, you have to be an adult to kill people? What? Bummer. Well, there were times in history uh, where, you know, 16, 17-year-olds, they would be able to enlist. It's, like, just not good. Yeah, it's not great. In 1955, he was arrested for a break-in. Following an escape from custody, he lived as a fugitive from the law for seven years. Whoa. So he was, like, escaping for seven years. Yeah. Pretty good run. Wow. He served five years in Leavenworth, and he made sure that none of that time went to waste. He would soon be reincarnated, if you will, as both an author, an outspoken, I don't want to say activist here, but feels like more than just your typical Tony Robbins type motivational speaker. Since he was outspoken specifically about topics like prison reform and criminal rehabilitation. And at this time in our nation's history, that was so hot right now. I mean, he's not wrong. I mean, he definitely is wrong (laughs) um, about him. Like this guy, he's wrong. (laughs) All wrong. Uh, My brain broke. He's wrong. The concept is not wrong. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, violent offenders, I think rehabilitation um, for certain crimes. I just, I don't know, man. 
<laughs> yeah. I mean, I would like to see them all have some sort of support, even if it's not to get out of prison. Yeah. But maybe some, you know, mental support. Could make a difference. I feel like, I don't know. Not that hard, right? To change an entire corrupt system? I mean, what? Like, it's hard? In 1967, following his release, he became a fairly popular media personality. Even guesting on the 1970s era game show, To Tell the Truth. (laughs) That's ironic. (laughs) My notes say, the irony should not be lost on anyone with this title. (laughs) Yay, I passed. (laughs) Yay. (laughs) Later that same year, his best-selling book, The Metamorphosis of a Criminal, The True Life Story of Ed Edwards, was released. I just want to pick up the phone and call 1972 like, hey, girl, are you okay? No. In 1977, things take a dark turn. Finally. (sighs) That's when his first confirmed murders took place in Ohio. This was a young couple who had been dating or going steady, as they more likely called it back then, for about eight months. So, per serious. Yeah. His victims were William Billy Lavaco, who was 21 years old. And his girlfriend, Judith Straub, 18 years old. Oh, Billy and Judy. I know. Judith's purse and shoes were inside their vehicle when it was discovered in the Silver Creek Metro Park on August 7th of 1977. Hmm. Rarely does leaving both your shoes and your handbag mean anything good. No. Their family members quickly gathered along with local law enforcement to search the surrounding area, aided by a National Guard helicopter. Wow. Yeah. The young couple was later found, having been shot at point-blank range with a 20-gauge shotgun. Jesus. Mm -hmm. Eventually, he would receive life sentences for these crimes in 2010. Wow. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay. Mm-hmm. Next was another double homicide referred to as the Sweetheart Murders. No, mm-hmm. I don't like that at all. No, you shouldn't. Everyone hates it. Don't kill sweethearts. Like, <laughs> this is going to fucking annihilate you. I hate it. They just want to love each other. Mm -hmm. You'll see. Just, you'll see. Yeah. Like two sentences from now, just, I love love. In 1980, Edwards was in Concord, Wisconsin, where he stabbed and strangled Tim Hack and Kelly Drew. After attending a wedding, the two went missing. Their bodies were not discovered until two months later. (sighs) Young lovers literally attending an event about fucking love. Literally Uh, love and fucking. I'm, yeah. I'm just trying to lighten the mood because I'm very sad. Yeah. Like very sad. Yeah. Tim had been stabbed in the back. Kelly had been bound and then sexually assaulted. On March 9th of 2009, NBC aired this 30-year-old case. This 30-year-old cold case. Wow. Mm -hmm. Ed's daughter recalled living in that same town where the crime occurred at the time before picking up and moving suddenly. Oh, he had a daughter? hmm Oh. He had children. Wow. Did you say that and I just like missed nope. it? Okay. Nope. This is the first we're hearing okay. of it. Yeah, I know. I was like, what? Ew. <laughs> Ew. 
he sucks. He nope. sucks. Yeah, he does suck. Yeah. <laughs> but also, he supposedly told the children as they drove out of town, they're going to find a couple of dead kids over there. You told your children that? Mm-hmm. Edwards had been questioned at the time, but there was no basis to hold or charge him with a crime. Yet. God, so he was just like really trying to make sure that his kids were also traumatized. Right? Edwards would later confess to the murder of his fucking ruins me. Edwards would also later confess to the murder of his foster son, 25-year-old Danny Law Glockner, a.k.a. Danny Boy Edwards, in Ohio in 1996. Danny Boy. Wow, so he was also fostering children? Apparently. And then doing the same things to those children that like, uh huh. I don't know why it like blows my mind so much. Like it doesn't, but I it does, know. and then it doesn't, yeah. and we all know how it goes. This poor young man had lived with Edwards and his family for several years. Edwards murdered Glockner in order to collect on a life insurance payout, which never really works, does it? Just ask. Nancy. Nancy yeah. Brophy. <laughs> yeah. If you're scratching your head, go back to that episode. I will find the episode number. If you're new, you're tuning in for the first time, I'll link it because it's just wild. It is. Immediately, that was what my head jumped to. I'm like, how's that working out for you, Nance? Yeah. <laughs> and Edward? <laughs> yeah, dicks. Danny was an army soldier that Edwards persuaded to go a wall. Edwards shot him twice in the face before leaving his body in a shallow grave. It was later discovered by a hunter. Mm. For this crime, Edwards would be sentenced to death, but not until March of 2011. Seriously? Can't help myself. I'm jumping way ahead. But I bet you can't guess what he did a month later. You guys, what did Edward do a month later? Did he kill someone else? You literally are going to have to wait until the very, very end to find out. Fine. Okay. In total, Edwards would be convicted and sentenced for five murders he committed between 1977 and 1996. Not super impressed with your metamorphosis. Edward. Oh, yeah. He wrote the whole book. Uh Oh, my God. I know. Really rich. (laughs) But it's the murders he has never been conclusively linked to and the wild conspiracy theories that abound in his case that makes this one so interesting. Because I don't know if you guys noticed, we have not been anywhere near the Pacific Northwest up to this point. I'm not going to lie. I didn't. (laughs) <laughs> notice. You're just like, oh my God, I hate this. Yeah, because you, you kept saying his hometown. He goes back to his hometown of Ohio. You're like, maybe they sent him to an orphanage in Oregon? Yeah, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> but I was like so intrigued. I didn't even notice. Yeah. Um. All right. Well, like put on your thinking cap, put on your reading glasses because it's about to get real wild. some have speculated that he may have been the zodiac killer no (laughs) zodiac killer theories are so varying and prolific in the true crime space and generally just within our nation's psyche and truthfully like even internationally, everybody has heard of this. Yeah. Have you, uh, wait, you've heard of this, right? I have. Okay. <laughs> so much so that at this point, I'd argue the saying opinions are like assholes 
everyone's <laughs> got one. I, like it kind of applies. Yeah. You know, seems apt. Everyone has a Zodiac killer theory. Pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone is the Zodiac killer. That's my theory for you. <laughs> <laughs> is there any convicted killer that someone somewhere out there doesn't think is the Zodiac killer? Some days it feels as though someone not being the Zodiac killer might be the real headline. You know, like, I guess that douche canoe out in Idaho, like, we know it wasn't him. Right? Do we? I Honestly, we now I don't know anything. I'm gaslighting myself. So, <laughs> thanks a lot. <laughs> Though, to be fair, one of his children is reportedly convinced that her father was the Zodiac. One of his kids mm -hmm. thinks this? Mm -hmm. So I'm open to it, I guess, but I remain extremely skeptical. What's more, though, his daughter is not alone in this theory. Hmm. John A. Cameron, a retired Montana police detective, authored the book, It's Me. Hi, I'm the problem, it's me. Just kidding. That's a different, that's a different title. Um, it's me. I'm the Zodiac killer. It's me. <laughs> <laughs> it's me. Edward Wayne Edwards, the serial killer you never heard of. Love it. <laughs> I own this book now. <laughs> of course you do. To be fair, though. Cameron also suspects that Ed was responsible for a whole slew of other murders that took place <laughs> in a number of decades and in vastly different locales. Oh, I'll, I'll rattle off a few here so you can get an idea of scope. Okay. Like you're going to know at least a couple of these. The Black Dahlia. An infamous old Hollywood murder that took place in the 1940s in Los Angeles. Just in case you've been living underneath a fucking rock. Then there's Marilyn Reese Shepard and Jimmy Hoffa. Because why not? <laughs> but we've got a ways to go on this list. Martha Moxley in Connecticut. The man initially convicted for her killing has since been released and her case remains unsolved, Aww. which is real shit. And I wish that people wouldn't fuck around with open investigations, but as someone who's not trying to get sued today, I'll move on. <laughs> also, the West Memphis Three, John Benet Ramsey, Chandra Levy, which this is the 2001 case of a congressman's murdered intern in D.C., um, Lacey Peterson, even the Atlanta child killings of the late 70s, and last but not least, Teresa Halbach. And here's the thing. We've all seen Making a Murderer and formed our opinions on the case as well as the guilt or culpability of both Stephen Avery and Brendan Dassey. Some of us might have some opinions about Manitowoc County, Wisconsin's law enforcement as well. <laughs> but do I think this guy had anything to do with it? Again, show me literally any evidence. I'm open to it, <laughs> but I remain skeptical. So he thinks this one guy did all of this? Potentially. How old was he in the 40s? <laughs> in 1940. He was born in 1933. So, okay. I mean, honestly, it kind of takes me back to Ardenwald, oh. which is not a place I made up. <laughs> <laughs> no. We covered it. Like, that's pretty far back, but it was an axe murder case here in the Portland metro area. I mean, well before this guy was murdered. So, hey, uh, Cameron, 
Um, he didn't do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but there was that book that I read where the author thought that the same person that he thought, oh my God, all of the axe murders all across the USA, they're all linked. Oh, yeah. Which, I, I mean, maybe. I doubt it, but Probably maybe. Not. You Probably. know, more than one people like have access to axes and stuff. So. Yeah, it turns out that was mm-hmm. something pretty much every fucking buddy had. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Props us not. I do have a theory, though. He could be right. If this guy has a time machine. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it like he could have committed all of these crimes. He could have. He could have. Um, I don't know why he went coast to coast to just commit so many crimes all over. And they're totally disparate types of crimes. So... He's a controversial figure, to say the least. Both Edward W. Edwards and the writer John A. Cameron, actually, (laughs) both of them, his writing hadn't led to any actionable tips or evidence being discovered, it seems, because most of these cases haven't seen much movement since they were last aired on Netflix, A&E, or Investigation Discovery, whenever that was respectively. What's interesting is Edwards was also implicated in some lesser known cases that really do spark my interest. Seriously, color me intrigued. She's not laughing this time. I'm not. Because other than the time he was hanging out in Ohio, Montana, or I don't know, Wisconsin, wherever the fuck, Um, Edwards apparently really did make it out to the West Coast. I don't like that. I know. I know. Don't visit here. Okay. Hashtag best coast, but like not for you. Yeah. Get out. If you're a murderer. Yeah. If you're friendly, you can come over. Maybe. (laughs) I'd like to. Maybe. Yeah. Like a screening interview. A creepy people screening interview. That'd Mm -hmm. be ideal. Yeah. That's right. Apparently, like. Every other serial killer on God's green fucking earth, Edward W. Edwards, made his way to Portland. Ah, It's almost like having a bar mitzvah. It's just like a rite of passage, you know? (laughs) It's here that he became what was known as a slippin' Jimmy. Cassie, how does that make you feel? Ew. (laughs) Slippery. (laughs) Yeah, gross pulling off various insurance schemes long before Saul. Oh. Uh Uh-huh. Other than Edwards bringing in around $8,000 in proceeds from the flim flams, Phil Stanford believed that he may have been responsible for some murders here in town. I don't like it. This was the murder of another couple, which... Certainly fits his M.O. Yeah. Beverly Allen and Larry Payton in Portland, Oregon, back in 1960. Oh. Payton's body, so this is the boyfriend, was found the next day in the vehicle on a Forest Park Road. Of course. So apparently that place is way more haunted than anyone has been letting on. We told you guys. His skull was caved in and he had been stabbed 23 times. Wow, that's a lot. It wasn't until six weeks later that Beverly Allen's raped and strangled body was found in a ravine off Highway 26. About 40 miles west of Portland. Not only did Edwards have a bullet wound in one arm that police believed might have been related to a bullet hole in the couple's windshield, but he had actually been seen hanging around the crime scene at one point. What? 
So his girlfriend, he said, is the one that shot him. You want to know why? Why? Oh, she was real mad. (laughs) She's real mad because she found out that he worked for the CIA. That's not something that the police could fact check at all. (laughs) So I think the whole thing was that like, I'm like, I want to know, did he tell the cops like, hey, yeah, my girlfriend was really mad because I told her I worked for the CIA. And he's like, like, obviously I don't. Or was he like, hey, yeah, guys, like I work for the CIA. And so like my girlfriend was really mad. She shot me. You guys get it. Like you're cops, you know, you get it. You get it, right? I don't, I have no idea. I like, but either that, way, it's <laughs> so stupid. It's, it's not awesome. It wasn't until several years later that two men were arrested and imprisoned for these murders. Eddie Jorgensen and Robert Brom. They were released from prison early on parole though authorities have long maintained that the right men were held responsible for the crimes. They just only wanted them to serve three and seven years, roughly, respectively. It's fine. Taking the lives of two people? Uh Uh-huh. I mean, the bigger question is, how could they possibly be sure that they got the right guys with an improperly secured crime scene And mishandling of crucial evidence. Mm. I, for one, can't say. Well. I mean, I could say. (laughs) I won't. Because I'm a lady. You can read more about that in Stanford's book, The Peyton Allen Files, if you're interested. Um, Or just like, also don't, because I'll probably circle back around for a more in-depth look at this case eventually. (laughs) That sounds good to me, because I don't want to read it. Yeah. No, I wouldn't. Don't read it. And here's the thing. All of this is interesting, right? But so many details remain unconfirmed in multiple of these cases. That's uh, so many cases. So many. How many? (laughs) It's a lot. Okay. With so many possible explanations and conspiracies. Honestly, it starts to make you feel like you might need a tinfoil hat or something. Yeah. (laughs) You know? And just when I thought that the retired detective from Montana was fully nuts, and he still might be. Probably. I learned about another man that shared his theory, at least in part. It was Detective Chad Garcia of the Jefferson County Sheriff's Office, who was in charge of the sweetheart murders case. He described in March of 2017 how the murders of Hack and Drew were solved thanks in large part to a tip from none other than Edward's daughter. You guys, I am not getting ahead of myself anymore. We've arrived. Spit it out. (laughs) At the time, he said he was, and I quote, pretty confident end quote, that Edwards likely had been responsible for at least five to seven more murders. He also believed that Edwards was involved in the Zodiac killings. Oh my gosh, he thinks it too? I Yeah, people can think a lot of things. And that's all I have to say about that. Do you think he was part of the Zodiac killings? I kind of don't. Why? I, 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 mean, I need a detailed explanation a right now. I, well, okay, <laughs> but we're not here for that. In the end, Edwards was 76 years old when the authorities were actually tipped off by his daughter, like I said, after she saw a TV special about an unsolved double homicide, our sweetheart murders. Mm. The strange bits and pieces from her memory started to just fall into place. By then, Edwards, in a beautiful, beautiful piece of karmic justice, was over 300 pounds, 
on oxygen and also wheelchair bound. Oh, okay. So whether he was as prolific as the Zodiac Killer at one point in time or not, probably not, he hardly seemed to pose a threat by this point. Edwards died of natural causes in a Columbus, Ohio Corrections Medical Center in April of 2011 at the age of 77 while serving his time on death row. You guys... Remember when I said, guess what he was going to do like a month later? Oh, yeah. It was die. Oh. He was going to die. Oh. Well, that's unfortunate. He narrowly avoided the needle as he was actually set to be executed by lethal injection on August 31st that same year. Damn. I mean, like, at least we don't got to hang out with him. Yeah. Edward. W. Edwards, number 160, on the FBI's former 10 most wanted fugitives list. A pretty anticlimactic end for an awful and senseless killer with the name to match. That was good. I mean, awful. He sucks. He super sucks. I like just don't want to even indulge the thought that he could be the Zodiac killer. Yeah. I honestly, like... I don't want to give him that much credit. Yeah. I know, as fucked up as that sounds, right? That was kind of my feeling as well. I'm like, eh. You ain't... You ain't shit. Yeah. (laughs) Seriously. Exactly. Exactly. And he's not. He ain't shit. You ain't shit. I mean, he's probably worm shit now. That is such a good point. I know. Now he is shit. Oh my God, you guys. He's finally the shit. It all comes back around. Like actual shit. <laughs> well, tarot? Tarot? Tarot. Let's do it. Okay. Chicken bakes first. Chicken bakes. Cassie. Caitlin. Do you know what I really want? What? A thirsty bitch sticker. Me too. Where do I get that? Nightshade botanicals nightshade botanicals that sounds like they have plants they do yeah but this one you see i can't kill but for people that actually have a green thumb like me nightshade botanicals is located at 6105 b roosevelt way northeast in seattle right here in the pnw the emerald city baby They have a repotting service. They have a houseplant consultation and plant diagnosis service. I need the bundle. You specifically. If you're not currently in Seattle, which, sorry about it, go to nightshadebotanicalsshop.com. They have a category called gothy plants, and I am obsessed. I need it. Get me off this website right now. Okay, I'm doing some shuffles, thinking about... Ew. Ew. Then I'm going to pass the deck to Caitlin, and she can shuffle it or draw or whatever she wants. I think... Oh. Oh, what did we get? Interesting. Because just on face value, it is... Justice in reverse. Okay. (laughs) Which is just kind of interesting because he literally died in prison. Like, I don't know. Some people people might be disappointed by that. (laughs) Yeah. Because it was of natural causes. Like, justice happened, but like, oh, it was a little. (laughs) But let's see what the tarot has to say. This is card number 11. Okay, so as you might suspect, our keywords are rectification, decision, finding balance, and legal matters. The justice card often depicts a female figure robed and crowned or sometimes armored. She holds a sword symbol of the air element and the mind in one hand and the other a set of scales. Lady Justice 
In some decks, she appears nude with arms outstretched in a balanced position, or she stands between a large set of scales while holding a smaller set. This justice isn't blind or blindfolded, however. Her eyes are open, suggesting divine justice is at work here rather than the laws of humankind. That kind of makes sense, I think, because it took them so long to find him. Like it wasn't. Yeah, it's that's rough. Yeah. You know, the justice card can represent an actual legal matter or someone who works in the judicial system. Whatever the situation, you must weigh many factors in order to make a reasoned decision. Okay, so there's an extra excerpt right before the reverse interpretation. Justice has ties to the Egyptian goddess Mat, whose name means truth and justice. She held a pair of scales upon which she weighed a newly dead person's soul against the feather of truth to decide if the soul was worthy to pass into the realm of Osiris, god of the underworld. Oh shit, you guys. I don't think he's going to make it. I was going to say, I don't think he passed. (laughs) I don't think he passed. Justice reversed indicates delays in legal matters or unfairness in some other situation. Sounds about right. If you're the person in power, you may be unduly severe in meeting out punishment. I mean, or not. If you're in the powerless position, you may feel angry or resentful at being treated unfairly. Your equilibrium is out of whack, and you may swing from one extreme to another. Hmm. In a reading about money, you may encounter a loss in a legal matter or feel a financial decision isn't fair. Oh, really? Like killing your adopted son or like foster son for the... Insurance money? Yeah. Oh, shit. Cassie. Does it talk about... (gasps) Perhaps you'll be required to make restitution to someone. This card can also represent delays or complications in receiving money that's due to you. Ha, because it wasn't due to you. (laughs) (laughs) Because you're a (laughs) duty. If the reading is about your job, justice reversed can signify an imbalance in your workplace, or a lack of cooperation. I'll say. Or this card may mean you have to account for an action or mistake. (laughs) In some cases, it may point to a legal issue involving the organization you work for. He was self-employed. I thought he worked for the (laughs) CIA, though. (laughs) Oh, my God. You're so (laughs) hilarious. I already forgot about that. (laughs) It was so funny. In a reading about love, you may feel a relationship lacks balance. And I know that I didn't go into some of his um, past relationships with the depth that um, maybe could explain why this makes sense. But take my word for it. I think we kind of gathered that (laughs) his you know, female relationships might be imbalanced. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes this card indicates having to answer for an indiscretion or wrongful action. I just feel like sometimes the universe gives us a card and it's just like, it's so easy. We don't really have to think about it too much. It's like, you know, you guys had a hard day. Let's just (laughs) give you this one. (laughs) Definitely. I was thinking about this earlier when I was just doing like one last over like check of my notes. And I saw the part where at the very beginning I was talking about that. That's like Joker level diabolical. And I was like, that'd be so funny if we got the fool. Oh, yeah. And the card that's number 12 is not the fool, but the The hanged hanged man. man. Yeah. Interesting. That is kind of interesting. Interesting for a man who was set to be executed, but I don't know. Yeah. I mean, listen, uh, not that I'm typically out there rooting for public uh, or any execution, but um, I mean, like sometimes, you know, 
he's definitely a confirmed dickhole. Like a professional <laughs> yeah. dickhole. So, yes, he you know, is. Would I shed a tear? No. And that's all I have to say about that. Well, this is an Osprey. I'm pretty sure we've gotten this card before in we this have. deck because I remember. Yeah, pretty the recently, Osprey. I think. Osprey. And yeah. I don't think we need to read this because we've read it pretty recently too. But it yeah. talks about the same type of thing that Caitlin talked about. So, yeah. Every <sighs> once in a while, it is interesting just to see how. It's interpreted. The wording is just a little bit differently. And yeah. things, things click for you in a slightly different way. Yeah, like the one with the heat. Yeah. Oh, boy. Yeah, I didn't like that. Made me oh. very uncomfortable. I am very uncomfortable. Well, do we have anything else to say before we go? Ew. Ew. <laughs> Ew, Edward. Ew. Team Jacob now. <laughs> <gasps> Have a creepy ass day. See you next Tuesday. So for all of you that are listening, if you have any true crime or paranormal stories that you want us to share, maybe with the whole Pacific Northwest. Yes, we would love to read them on the pod. <laughs> yes, we will read them out loud. <laughs> Not just in our heads. Yes. <laughs> they don't have to be from the Pacific Northwest. If you would like to share, email us at pnwhauntsandhomicides at gmail.com. It's all spelled out. No special characters. Super duper easy peasy. Follow us on Instagram and Facebook. Same thing as the email at PNW Haunts and Homicides, all spelled out, no special characters. Please also rate and review us on whatever platform you're listening to and check out our stories on social media because our meme game is hot. <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> and if you agree, like Caitlin, you can also find us on Patreon and support the show. Bitchin'. <laughs> Why would you change his first name? Like Charlie. To Edward. Charlie. Charles. Charlie can't come to the phone right now. Not because he's dead. Not like Taylor Swift. Wait. <laughs> Taylor can't come. To, wait. Taylor Swift Taylor is dead. Taylor can't come to the phone right now. Oh. Why? Because she's dead. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. I was like, wait. It just like popped no. into my, Charlie can't come to the phone right now. <laughs> Why? No, that was good. That's so funny. <laughs> anyway. If you're a frequent PNW Haunts and Homicides listener, you probably already know we're Birdie Ambassadors. We wanted to take a quick moment to tell you a little bit more about this awesome product. Birdie is the modern personal safety alarm made for women by women. In a situation where you feel threatened or unsafe, you can simply activate Birdie's loud siren and flashing light to create a diversion. Birdie is perfect to carry anytime because the device is lightweight and comes in a variety of colors. So important. Use our ambassador link and coupon code PNW Haunts and Homicides to receive 10% off your purchase. Like our social media handles, the coupon code is all spelled out, no special characters. You can find the link and promo code in our show notes or PNW Haunts and Homicides link tree. Have, Have a, a safe, safe ass day! day.